I, I want to move um, just from the discussion of patenting and policy and other things more towards open data. So that's the next phase. And then, and then we're going to talk about data, and then we're going to talk about specifically about malaria um, as the afternoon goes on. But we've got a few people here interested in open data. Um, and I, I just want to move it into that domain. And I, I want to mention a few things about other projects which are um, open while we're talking about that, um, just to frame that discussion. So the, the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about this afternoon to do with malaria will be naturally based on open data, but also about projects where people can participate and other things. And there are a bunch of examples that are up there which are, which are, which are quite well known, varying in, in what they are. So the, the Foldit project, for example, is this thing where you can crowdsource finding the, the low energy confirmation of a protein, um, which is a well-known example. Whereas, and, and Galaxy Zoo was a, was a crowdsourcing project, uh, which involved a lot of people making lots of measurements, uh, lots of uh, judgments about uh, galaxy structures and other things. Um, there are a number of different things, and of course the, the OSDD project from India is, is up there too. Uh, whereas the Polymath blog was much more like the kind of project which, which we've done, um, which is where people, there aren't that many people who are involved, but there are, there, they have to do a more kind of creative, well, a, a, a more involved contribution, which is perhaps scientifically, uh, um, well, it, it's contributing to the basic science of the project. The Polymath blog was an example where a bunch of mathematicians collaborated on a wiki to solve a certain problem in pure mathematics. So, uh, but all the thing which links all of these, of course, is that there has to be a lot of uh, data behind the project, and it varies depending on the project. Um, so, the, the, there's in the case of the Follett and Galaxy Zoo project, the data were the data behind the science, but the, the, it wasn't necessary to have um, a lot of the the project open for discussion by lots of participants. It was a question of just having data there which people could comment on. Um, in the case of, um, of of the project involved in drug discovery, you're going to need a lot of open data, which is based on um, chemical synthesis compounds and biological evaluation of compounds, and, and it's going to be a certain requirement to have all of that, all of those data in the public domain in a way that can be found. So the first thing to do in an open project is to is to think about the the sharing of data, and that's the first that's the first point that we need to get across is that an open source project requires all the data to be shared. That's not enough for an open source project because open source implies that people can participate in doing the research. But it's required at the start that you have data that's shared. And that's going to have certain requirements in terms of how data are stored and archived and how people can interact with those data. Um, and so that this brings up a technical, we're going to get onto the idea of open source in, in, in after lunch, I think, where we're going to be talking about how people can collaborate in real time in an open way. But behind the scenes, there's all of the stuff about open data which is necessary. Now, I thought it would be a good time to discuss that a little bit. Um, and, uh, and so we have a few people in the room who could, who could maybe say a few things about open data. Um, and Andrew, did you want to kick off and say something about, about ANDs? I don't know if you want to present or show something on a web browser. Um, I managed to feel quite so intimidated. Yep. Uh, which, yeah. So I just click to Firefox. So my name's Andrew Trelaw, and I work for a thing called the Australian National Data Service, uh, which is the page that I've got up at the moment, ands.org.au, for those of you that are following along at home. Uh, we're a government-funded organisation funded out of uh, what is now either called the Department of Desert or the Department of Desert, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It was the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research, and it's now, and possibly until Monday at least, also tertiary education. Um, so we're, if you like, in the research infrastructure space. So I'm not a researcher, or I was in a previous life. Um, I'm a, an e-research infrastructure guy, and um, the easiest way to think about what we're doing is we're trying to partner to bring about four transformations, and helpfully, those transformations probably large enough. Those transformations are highlighted on the web page, and I just want to quickly take you through them so that you can see how they play into the kind of open data agenda that. Matt wants to focus on. 
So the first is we're trying to move from data that's unmanaged to managed. And what we mean by that is uh, the unmanaged stuff is the stuff that I guess most of us still have. Data on um, USB sticks, data on DVDs, data on laptops, data on PhD students' laptops that the PhD students left the university two years ago, um, data scattered all over the place. So I think we can all empathize with this. Um, some of us may even have data on floppy disks, I certainly have. And so we're trying to get that from something that is essentially unmanaged to something that is now more managed. And by that I mean on a, a departmental server or possibly even a university server or something in the new research data storage infrastructure that Australia is rolling out so that it's less vulnerable. That's a start, but it's not enough. So the next transformation that we're focused on is moving from stuff that is disconnected from the context in which it was created to much more connected in, into the context. And what I mean by context here is having a sense of how the data relates to the research project that produced it or the organization that it was done through or the researchers that took part in it or the models that were used to produce it, or the publications that are associated with it. So all of this, if you like, is the context that wraps around the data, which is largely invisible. Um, if you could, even if you could get access to the data, you probably can't get easy access to the context within which that data came into being. And that context is important both for discovery and, as we'll see in a minute, for reuse. The third transformation that we're focused on is the transformation from invisible to findable, and that unmanaged data is, because it's sitting on someone's desktop, largely unfindable, unless you know the person, unless you bump into them at a conference, you've talked to them about their paper, and they said, oh yeah, I can give you a copy of the data set that's available. But if you don't go to the right conferences, uh, then how do you know to find it? Now, there are discipline-specific discovery places for this kind of stuff. If you're a marine researcher, you know to go to the Australian Ocean Data Network, for instance. The sweet spot for ANS is really around people who are outside the discipline getting access to data that they could use. So one of the groups that we're working with is not working on malaria drugs, but is working on how climate change might play into malaria prevalence in the Pacific, so that as the world gets warmer and wetter, there are going to be many more places for mosquitoes to breed and therefore you're going to expect to see a spread in malaria and dengue fever and Ross River and a whole range of other exciting diseases. Um, but those groups need access to data outside their disciplines. And so the thing that we've produced, which is nowhere near as cool as the patent lens, is a thing called Research Data Australia, which is intended to be a discovery service that will let you discover Australian research data. Now, of course, nobody cares about Australian research data in the same way that nobody cares about UCID research data. What they care about is data. And so the model that we're using for this is that all of the pages for the 31,000 collections and 4,600 people and 27,000 research projects all of those are individual web pages that are indexed through Google and being in Yahoo. And so the model is that you discover these things somewhere else and end up here. And then once you've found something, we then want to make sure that the fourth transformation has occurred, which is that the data is moved from single use to reusable. So that instead of the data being collected once, and then lost or thrown away or stuck on a shelf, it's made available for people to reuse it. Now, in order for the data to be reusable, you need to understand some of that context. You need to know why it was collected. In some cases, you may need to know how it was collected. You may need to know what the settings, the calibration settings were on the instrument, how it was sequenced, a whole range of things. Again, stuff that typically doesn't get collected and made available. And then all of that, all of that work, getting it managed, getting it connected, getting it findable, getting it reusable, is, if you like, preparatory work. It's, it's just plumbing in the background. I mean, I care about this stuff because I care about plumbing. But really, the, the point of all of that is to make sure that the reusable data is actually reused. 
So really the end game for us is having data being reused so that people are building on work that other people have done. And I'm sure this is a theme we're going to pick up this afternoon. And of course, that's not just a technology problem. As we've heard this morning, some of it is a legal problem. Some of it's a technology problem. Some of it is a problem around open software. There's a very interesting article in Nature last week, I think, on um, arguing that the software that's used to process the data should also be made available as open source, because otherwise, how do you reproduce the science? Um, the whole question of open workflow models, of licensing regimes, and we've got various bits of activity around that space trying to, to move the state of the art forward there. But a lot of what we're doing is essentially this kind of back-end stuff, working with universities, with CSIRO, um, with the ARC and the NH and MRC to try and move the, the state of the world forward. That's probably as much as I want to say as, a, as an overview. Is that kind of the... The level you wanted? Yeah, sure. Does anyone have media? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are. We're, it's voluntary. We're, we're bribing universities to put stuff in at the moment. Um, but anybody, we in fact have got a, a service called Publish My Data, which lets anybody go in and say, "I want to tell you about some data I've got." We're working with universities to make it easier for them to manage the data outputs that their researchers produce and feed those through to us. So if I, to use your example, am a cli climate change scientist mm -hmm. interested in how malaria will spread if I type in malaria. Yeah, I should have actually done that search. Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, so we've got projects. What have we got that, okay, if I look at the facets. Uh, we've got 211 projects of the 236 results. Two programs, six people, only four data sets, nine collections. So most of the information we've got is project information, which we're getting directly from the NH and MRC or the ARC. But we do have some. Uh, so, OK. Pacific <coughs> diseases from the records of Frank McFarlane Burnett. So this looks like it's mostly kind of archival stuff from people who are working, were working on, yeah. Um, I'm actually wondering where that's coming from. Okay, University of Melbourne Archives. So yeah, it's mostly archival stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's how you measure data if it's in bits of dead tree, yeah. <laughs> or archive boxes, you know, 23 archive boxes. I guess they're a fixed size. Yep, sure. So, uh, just so just a few more minutes before we um, have lunch. Uh, it's it's interesting to to think about the the differences between the dis the disciplines, I guess. Um, so, I was at the the AAAS conference the last week, and there was a guy there from Stanford, a biologist, uh, Atul Boot, who who does a lot of data science. So he collects, well, he he interrogates data from large public repositories of data, so microarray data, and spots patterns in the data to make new discoveries. Doesn't do have any wet lab stuff. And in fact was making a point about the fact that he outsources a lot of his wet lab experiments to the highest well, the lowest bidder. Um, so he, he gets things done by private companies but has no wet lab, but but it has these papers that are being generated just from the analysis of other people's data. And I was looking at that and thinking, well that only happens in biology. It doesn't really happen in chemistry because chemistry doesn't have is, as I said before, chemistry hasn't had its human genome moment where all of chemical data of reaction outcomes has been donated into the public domain. And if that happened, I don't know what would happen, but we would have a huge increase in discovery as far as I'm, I'm concerned. So the differences between chemistry and biology are interesting because we have a bioinformatician and a chemoinformatician in the room. And I don't know if you just wanted to say anything about the state of open data, uh, your experience with open data, and, and what you get out of that um, in, terms of the, in terms of your day job. Do you want to, because I think you're both CSIRO. <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, do you have microphones? So yeah, uh, Neil Saunders and, and Nico Adams are both here. So I don't know if you want to, have anything to add about in terms of the, the use of open data, whether it's difficult to generate and, and the benefits of, of having data. Where, where you don't necessarily know the, the, um, the question you're asking, but having data there is useful for, for unintended reasons. No, I can stay there. 
on. If you want to, you can say that. Yeah, I can. I can just say something very generally. Uh, in in bioinformatics, um, open data is almost everything. It's it's you know you can't do bioinformatics without public databases, uh, public literature, you know, pu public everything. Um, one thing that's maybe not talked about a lot is data quality. Um, so there is a lot of public biological data. Um, but a lot of it's kind of a dump. I mean, it's interesting. You're talking about Athel Butter, Butter's work. Um, I don't know how he does what he does with the quality of the data that he uses. <laughs> He's a very clever man, I think, because um, you know I've waded through a lot of public microarray data, and a lot of it is absolutely awful. Um, and you need a lot, quite a lot of statistical skill to to tease anything out of it, so, so data he, quality is a big issue, I think. He talked about that and said that he, he would rather try and do science with the data as currently as it currently stands, rather than waiting five years for it to be standardized. So I think he deals with the noise that's there yeah. and knows that it's there. Um, and for example, if he does get a, a biological experiment done, he gets a lab on the east coast of the states and the west coast of the states to do it at the same time and compares try to minimize noise, I guess. But he, he acknowledges that and works within that constraint. And, um, but I think it's a very interesting point that I think a lot of people are skeptical about the field because they worry about the noise. Yeah, so that's, that's all I had to say, really. Maybe Nico wants to say something. Yes, yeah, so what's the situation of open data in chemistry? Very short answer to that, there isn't any. And one can, one can speculate why that is. Certainly, when comparing to the and first of all, I'm, I'm just making assertions here, so take them with a take them with. Well, um, chemistry is not um, unique and time dependent, unlike biology. In biology, you can often only do an experiment once. Well, that means it's that automatically much, much larger. Second thing is that um, almost as soon as we understood chemistry and have notions of chemical structure, tied up to business interests, both in terms of industry um, because all chemical data at the moment is in essence locked up in scholarly publications and because of a copyright to publishers, the publishers have a business of extracting data out, making them available as databases, and selling that back to us. It's very, very hard to get to get hold of that data. Just to just to clarify on that, that the, the the signing of the copyright for a paper typically will also include the data that's yes. contained in the paper. And some and some and some scholarly and some and some scholarly um, sorry, some publishers and amongst them some scholarly. Uh, Societies um, have started to, for example, put copyright notices on paper now. Now you may well argue, you, you may well argue about whether copyright can indeed adhere in this type of data. In some jurisdictions it can, in some jurisdictions it probably can't. Whether it can or it can't, it is an it is an effective deterrent, certainly to an academic researcher who, for example, is interested in hex mining. Wants to get sued, right? And who wants to have to justify to their manager, either or their professor, depending on where you work, uh, why you should run the risk of getting sued? So even if these copyright notices wouldn't stand up in court, they are effective for towns. And and it really is a circular problem. We, on the one hand, develop tools for information extraction. We then, under great difficulty, because of course we need source. 
opera and so on and so on and so on. We have to obtain them from publishers because what's out there isn't enough. Develop these tools. We can't really properly write papers about the development of these tools because So, therefore, we don't do proper and reprehensible academic work. So then we have those tools. We write papers about them, but we make assertions about how well these tools work with us. We can't do anything with them. The sources are still the sources are still closed. There's Now there have been there have been Cambridge said there is this lie which goes out in this mission of and of knowledge of publishing by this supplementary information. Transfers it to a data market at academia. Um, we have got ChemSpider, which is a database of chemistry, which is I don't clarify what free means. Is it free to use? Is it free to use? Can I download the whole thing? So the license situation uh, quite often is clear. And beyond that, there isn't anything. We even leave the provision of chemical identity to scholarly society which in turn charge for it. So the CAS identifier, for example, is the proprietary identifier used across the whole world. But if you want to resolve a CAS identifier to a structure, you pay. And you pay and you pay handsomely. And as a final as a final point, um, in chemistry we also have a situation where all the information providers, even those that are there to further the discipline, and by that I mean the scholarly societies, are publishers, and they're the same organizations. And certainly, as far as the ACS is concerned, the remuneration of a lot of the ACS offices is actually dependent on how well the publishing business of the ACS does. Whereas chemistry is a publishing business, not just a scholarly society. It derives its revenue from these activities. While these two activities, furtherance of the discipline, The only solution, the only solution really is at the moment for chemists, researchers to make their data available at the point of at the point of generation in an open source way, publish it out on, on the web. And there we have the problem is that we that we don't have the tooling to do that easily. Because we don't have tooling and because we don't have academic reward systems, which also comes in, there is no academic reward for for, for I'm rambling a bit, but I think Great, thank you. I mean, it's a very interesting point, which will lead into what we're going to talk about after lunch, um, which will cover um, electronic lab notebooks, which my group's using, for example, which we'll talk about. Um, we'll talk about academic reward and metrics a little bit when we talk about how to publish papers based on open science. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about, well, we should, we should mention what in passing, one service which has just started recently for a data publication called Fixture, run by Mark Harnell in London, right, which is associated with Nature, I think, um, but is a separate service. And that allows people to take some data and publish that. And they're working very hard on trying to um, generate um, sensible ways of, of showing the impact of a data set by a number of times. It's linked to, for example, and gives it a permanent home on the web. That's an interesting measure, which is very similar to some of the stuff we're doing with these uh, online electronic lab notebooks, which I'll talk about. Uh, which we'll, we'll hear about uh, after lunch. Do you want to come back? Yeah, just 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 one um, final thought. It, sometimes it comes down where the data is available. Sometimes it comes down to very very small things. So, for example, there was the 
you know, institutional repository movement we want to do. And while it's nice to have institutional repositories and, and uh, you know, doctoral thesis openly available in institutional repositories, for example, why we have a situation where in an institutional repository, the copyright to the thesis is either copyright of the thesis owner or copyright of the university, depending on what the regulation is, even though it's free to view, that again stops certainly other researchers who want to do search by machine, who want to do data extraction, from getting, from getting, from getting hold of that data. Small, tiny, trivial point, but how we set up our systems, and in particular how we set up our, our regime of licenses, I guess I just wanted to respond to uh, end of an optimistic and pessimistic. <laughs> In the field of malaria, I think that we really do have actually some superb bioinformatic and chemoinformatic resources. And perfect. Uh, they actually you know, demonstrably led to insights in terms of drugs. So we've got a, a B database. That's really wonderful. You were talking about quality of data in microarrays. But in plasma, it's, it's very clear that the microarrays have led to understandings about what drug targets are. In the chemoinformatics space, there are um, databases like the Kemble database. has some limited data, but very useful data on drugs that inhibit malaria parasites. And the, the website that we're involved with, the TDR Targets website, that, that talks about compounds and their effect on parasites. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, examples where those databases have led to discoveries, they, they're known, right? Uh, so, so in terms of the chemoinformatics, I'd say they're more embryonic because they've only appeared in the last small period. But there's a, a, a probably a good example is that the insight into the target of uh, the drug doxycycline, one of the most widely used anti-malarial drugs, that's clearly, uh, the insight into that is clearly almost purely from bioinformatics. Um, the use of sequence data to discover that there were, there's a chloroplast in uh, malaria and that that chloroplast is the target and that's been confirmed in, in the last couple of months now. Okay. If uh, if I think it's maybe it's a good time for to break for lunch because then after lunch we will come back and um, continue this, but with a increasingly malaria focus um, as we go through the afternoon. Um, so thanks very much for the, for this morning. There should be hopefully sandwiches outside, unless the class next door to us has gone like a plague of locusts all over them. We, we, there's none left. We'll, we'll see when we get outside. All right. Thanks. <laughs>